My presentation today is on data governance in trade agreements, the three digital kingdoms. When we talk about data in trade agreements, we confront three main issues. The first one is the commercial interest of the firm, which because they operate at the global level, therefore, they want to have a free flow of information across the borders, and they are against uh, various requirements uh, by local governments uh, to localize the data. And the second type of interest are the rights of the consumers, more accurately, the personal rights or the privacy rights of consumers. For consumers, they are most concerned with the protection of personal data, so for them, privacy is a primary concern. And last but certainly not least, we have the government which has the power to regulate the sector. And for the government, it is very important to ensure the national security and also make sure that whatever data that is transferred online does not comprise efforts of law enforcement. So uh, when you look at the negotiation of these three issues, they are negotiated at various fora. The main one should have been the WTO, but unfortunately, because of the state of the Doha round is in nowadays, so we do not have any role in the WTO so far. Instead, it is mainly regulated under domestic law, free trade agreements, and the prolateral initiatives. And that is where we see the rise of three different regimes. So when you look at the WTO, the WTO has tried to negotiate uh, rules on uh, e-commerce or digital trade since 1998 when the W2 members issued a declaration on, uh, on global electronic commerce but unfortunately they were not able to reach any agreement on the issue and they were only able to reach uh, a moratorium on customers duties on cross-border trade which has been kept until today. And the declaration also set out a work program which envisaged possible work by the various bodies of the WTO, such as the Council for Trading Services, Council for Trading Goods, Trips Council, and Council for Trading Development. But unfortunately, as I mentioned earlier, for almost 20 years, the WTO was unable to reach any agreement on the issue until four years ago when in anticipation of the Ministerial Conference in Buenos Aires, the WTO members have started to uh, renew their interest on e-commerce and started to table more proposals. And this finally uh, culminated in the launch of e-commerce talks in Davos, Switzerland in January 2019. And that is where we see the prolateral initiative in e-commerce being conducted. So now uh, let's look at beyond the WTO. You can see that uh, there are three digital kingdoms emerging, and these are the US, EU, and China. Let's first look at the US. For the US, the key interest for them is to ensure free flow of information across the border. And the US also is against uh, the data localization requirements that is uh, prevalent in many countries. And for privacy, the U.S. does not have a comprehensive protection framework on privacy. It, it does not have a single law that uh, regulates the issue of privacy. Instead, what you see is that there is a patchwork of sector-specific laws that regulate uh, specific issues relating to privacy. For example, in the U.S., there are laws which regulate issues such as privacy when it comes to credit reports, when it comes to video rental, but there's no overall law that regulates it at the horizontal level. This coupled with the enforcement efforts by the Federal Trade Commission and also uh, the self-regulation of the firms from the regulatory framework for the issue in the U.S. The U.S. has also been very active in including language on free flow of data and prohibition of data localization requirements in the free trade agreements, and this is reflected in many of the agreements the U.S. has signed, such as the TPP and the USMCA. If you look at this agreement, for example, you find prominently in these agreements there are rules which are designed to ensure the free flow of information and also uh, prohibition of data localization requirements 
and prohibition of false transfer of source code, which are uh, the main issues, the main uh, uh, demands the U.S. would make in these agreements. Similarly, in the trading services agreement negotiation or the TISA negotiation, the U.S. has been raising similar requests, but unfortunately, when Trump came into office, he basically put a hold on TISA, and so far, TISA has been uh, in suspension since Trump came into office. Now, for the EU, the key issue for them is privacy, and this is reflected in the General Data Protection Regulation, or the GDPR. And the key thing for the EU is that uh, they recognize the privacy not just as a consumer right, as the way it has been regulated in the U.S., where you see, for example, you have a privacy when it comes to uh, the personal information that is related to your credit reports or the personal information which is related to your video rental records. But you have to be a consumer in the sector to enjoy such a right. In other words, if you have never rented a video, you will not enjoy the privacy right for video rental customers. But in the EU, this is different because they regard this not just as a consumer right, but also more importantly, as a fundamental human right, which would be enjoyed by every person as a human being. So uh, that is why the GDPR uh, is so significant, because it regulates the issue of privacy as a basic human right. And the, uh, according to the GDPR, you cannot transfer the data between the EU and other countries unless the other country has adopted the same GDPR framework or their privacy protection regime is regarded as adequate by the EU. So far, only about a dozen countries has signed adequacy uh, uh, agreements with the EU and uh, uh, it is unclear whether the EU is going to expand that. And if you look at the uh, free trade agreements the EU has concluded, they were unable to include provisions on data issues in trade agreements uh, for a long time. And this was only resolved in February 2018 because uh, for a long time, their own internal divisions, DG Trade, which regulates the trade agreements, and DG Justice, which regulates the privacy issues, were unable to reach internal compromise themselves. And then finally, in February 2018, they were able to reach a compromise so that for all of EU's future trade agreements, they would first of all have a horizontal clause that guarantees a free flow of data and also ban on data localization requirements. At the same time, they affirm the EU's right to regulate, and most importantly, this would not be subject to the ISDS uh, mechanism, the Investor State Arbitration mechanism. So, uh, in existing FTAs, the EU has taken a soft position, uh, that is to say that um, they do not have any uh, hard requirements on the protection of our privacy. Instead, if you look at, for example, the Canada-EU trade agreements, the Japan-EU EPA, what they do is that uh, they would require the other party to adopt your own law for personal data protection, but they do not have any uh, uh, hard rules as to how this would be done. Uh, and after the GDPR came into being, there has been some concern that uh, there could be potentially intrusive rules in the GDPR, and we would have to wait and see how this is played out. Now, finally, let's discuss China as another major player. For China, the key issue when it comes to data is the cyber sovereignty or cyber security. And China regards this as a, its fundamental interest when it comes to data governance. And in China also, there's no free flow of information because of the existence of a, a censorship regime which blocks certain websites or filters certain websites. As to privacy, uh, China also did not have a long history of a protection of privacy. Uh, the uh, law on privacy protection was only enacted in 2009, about 11 years ago, and it remains uh, rather weak because there are extensive exemptions for the government. And uh, uh, if you look at other laws, uh, such as the uh, newly enacted cybersecurity law uh, in 2017, this law actually explicitly requires the uh, key information 
uh, to be uh, stored in local server. So this would be in conflict with the demands by the U.S. Uh, to uh, remove data localization requirements. And if you look at China free trade agreements, uh, it has not included a data regulation issue in most of its trade agreements, except the uh, more recent agreements, such as the one with uh, Korea and uh, Australia. And China in the WTO has been raising this initiative called the EWTO and later renamed as the EWTP, Electronic World Trade Platform. So this is a platform that is advocated by Alibaba and its chairman, Jack Ma, and it basically uh, uh, advocates to uh, improve trade facilitation for e-commerce, for uh, uh, the type of sense that Alibaba does best. And uh, this has uh, received a warm reception uh, from around the world, with uh, several hubs of EWTP uh, being uh, open around the world. And uh, the WTO even signed uh, uh, an agreement with Alibaba on collaborating uh, the uh, EWTP. So in its FTAs, if you look at the FTAs with Korea and Australia, for example, both FTAs include provisions on electronic commerce, but they mainly focus on the trade facilitation issues. So why do we have the differences among the three different approaches? This can be explained in two ways. The first is because these three countries have a different interests. For the U.S. firms, the, uh, if you look at the top 10 firms, uh, top 10 digital firms in the world, six are American firms, four are Chinese firms. So the American firms are firms like uh, uh, Facebook, Google, uh, and Netflix, which tend to sell digitized products. They do not sell physical products. Instead, they will sell some sort of uh, online products that you get online. While Chinese firms on the list would include firms such as Alibaba, and JD.com, which are actually still selling traditional physical goods. The only difference is that they now move the transaction process online, but the underlying products are still physical products. And if you look at the EU, uh, now no EU firm is on the top 10 list, so that means that the EU is not a major player. So that is why they do not want to uh, have uh, uh, um, uh, uh, have a main uh, role uh, when it comes to a trade facilitation or data localization or free flow of data. Instead, they will focus on privacy. And also, there will be different regulatory philosophies. In the U.S., there has been a long history of self-regulation, where if you look, for example, at the U.S. Telecommunication Act, they have emphasized that they should keep the internet sector and fettered by federal and uh, state regulations because they believe that uh, the lack of regulation is the reason why the sector could uh, uh, progress uh, so successfully and so rapidly. And in China, there has been a long history of a heavy government intervention ever since the start of the internet in China in 1994. So you see that the Chinese government has uh, evolved from hardware regulation to software regulation and not content regulation. And in the EU, there is a strong tradition of a human rights protection, partly in response to the uh, tragedies uh, uh, of the Second World War. So that explains why there are different approaches, because American firms specialize in digital products, so therefore for them, the most important thing is to have free flow of data across the border, and because for Chinese firms, they sell mostly physical goods, so for them, the most important thing is trade facilitation rules. While for EU firms, because uh, they do not uh, uh, have a big uh, either digital firms or e-commerce firms like China, therefore, they want to focus on privacy, which some would argue is a form of uh, trade protectionism that can help to protect EU's uh, uh, interests. Uh, in uh, the sector by erecting artificial barriers on e-commerce uh, for American and Chinese firms. So if you look at the future, uh, I'm not very optimistic because in the, for the future, uh, what you are likely to see is that we have a fragmented system when it comes to data regulation. In the WTO, even though uh, they have started the so-called joint statement initiative on e-commerce, 
But because of the differences between the main players in the negotiation, especially the U.S. on one hand and China on the other hand, I do not think that they would be able to reach rules on issues such as free flow data and prohibition of data localization requirements. Instead, most likely, they are probably going to reach some sort of uh, agreement on trade facilitation, which would be uh, very light. And when it comes to uh, prolateral agreements such as TISA, there is a possibility that TISA can reach provision on free flow of information and a ban on data localization requirements. But because TISA is now put on hold, I'm not sure that uh, this would be continued. Most likely, uh, the issue of uh, uh, data flow and the issue of privacy protection would be handled instead by domestic and bilateral initiatives such as free trade agreements. So that concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you.